Okay, let's get started with lecture number one. And lecture number one is going to be a little review slash history slash fundamentals slash the differences between Linux and Unix and slash, you know, lecture number one for a Unix course. So it's going to be kind of boring for some, but maybe kind of interesting learning for others. I'm going to kind of go through it kind of on the fast pace. It's about 50 slides long. Um, so let's see how far we get through purpose of the lecture, go over the fundamentals of using Linux and Linux-like and Unix-like systems, the history of Linux and Unix, basic system commands, data management, and constructing basic shell scripts. So it, it does cover a lot, so see how far we get. Wouldn't be appropriate without starting out with a history. Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. Actually, Dennis Ritchie, they used to call him, some still do actually refer to him as like the godfather of the C programming language. In fact, if you ever find one of his books, and there's, um, they're still in print actually, Dennis Ritchie has a ton of books. He is, um, he's like the creator of C. And, uh, you know, long story short, well, Unix is C. So Unix is a C programming language, and slash operating system. It's built in C, and it was basically uh, created for a development environment by these guys. So back in 1972, which doesn't seem that long ago either, uh, 1972, well, maybe for me it seems doesn't, I don't know, a uh, number of different types of Unix installation has grown to 10, with more expected. This quote was taken from 1972. So we had like 10 installs, perhaps. Yeah, probably had a little bit more than that, maybe. And then we had the boom. So we had a lot of Linux, and excuse me, a lot of Unix. And this is a Unix, is what I'm referring to. Linux came along a lot later. And uh, Unix was made for large computers, for special Unix systems, Unix boxes as they refer to them, that were made by, let's say, for example, uh, DAC, HP, IBM. And they all had their own separate versions of it, uh, Sun. Sun, Sun, the Sun OS that works on the Sun hardware. So hardware vendors were coming out with versions and breeds of Unix to support their hardware, long story short. So it's all driven by hardware. And so <coughs> companies like HP, for example, have their own operating system, HP UX. It runs on HP, and it's Unix, essentially. Sun, everyone's familiar with that, is Sun OS. And then we have different programs that run specifically and they're, they're built specifically for the different Linux breeds. It's not cross-platform compatible as most people would think actually. In fact even Linux is not necessarily cross it's compatible to a certain point but it's not the same operating system uh, used in each one of the different uh, the different builds or the different but it is very close to almost being compatible. Um, so let's say, for example, you're writing a C program and you compile it on a Ubuntu box. Nine times out of ten, you're going to be able to take that comp compiled file and bring it over to a Debian system or a Debian-like Ubuntu, which is, Ubuntu is built on Debian, but uh, kind of a, a sort of a like operating system of the Linux variety, and it's going to work. You take and you put it over on an HP UX, not going to work. Take and put it on a Sun UX, not going to work. You're going to get, you know, not compiler errors, but you, you, that executable file was made for a target platform or a tar target operating system. It's almost like the difference between loading something on a Windows ME box, as anyone still has ME out there, and a Windows 7. Well, in the Windows days, most of the varieties with the different versions. So, and they built on each other. So, like Windows 7 is mostly much better than Windows ME, much better than Windows Vista, hopefully. Uh, Windows Vista was terrible. Uh, but in the generation of Microsoft and that operating system, uh, things grew in progression as upgrades. Different, totally different in Unix, actually. It's the same operating system. But what which changes is the software. So we have applications that are get loaded on the operating system. The operating system itself has been the same since 1972. Well, you know, upgrades, you know, you know, fixes and stuff like that made to work with different hardware, uh, but it's, it's the system's the system. It's the same system. So Unix today and Unix, you know, 1972 is pretty much the same, actually. Uh, and so what ended up happening eventually, I mean, we started out with Unix, and what ended up happening eventually is people said, well, what, we, we want Unix on a desktop computer. We want Unix on this other hardware over there, this, you know, 
And that's where Linux came into place. So Linux is a stripped down version of Unix. It's a baby Unix. And uh, it's made for PC software. I mean, excuse me, PC hardware. It's made for desktop computers, notebook computers, uh, desktops, um, IBM compatible stuff um, versus the Unix box. So, and if you're not familiar with Unix as a concept, the Unix boxes themselves, oh, here's a picture of Dennis Ritchie and Ten Con. You can stare at this picture a little bit longer now because you probably already read the quote on the last slide. Um, these guys, uh, they, they don't look too fancy. You know, they look like grassroots developers. Uh, they're, not, they're not the spit image of uh, celebrities either, but they are celebrities. Um, but long story short, the Unix is part of the movement of open source as well, and Linux is open source. You don't actually have to buy this operating system. When you buy Unix boxes, though, you're buying the operating system with the box. So a Sun OS comes with a license of Sun software. That's not free, actually. That comes with the, the box. Maybe you want to call it a box. I call it a box only because that's kind of the generic term for a Unix box. It's a Unix box. Well, it's distributed computing is what it really is in general. Um, large companies still still doing this, but now the desktop computers are so cheap, they just buy a dozen or so desktop computers and put one on everybody's desk and uh, hook it all up to Microsoft networking or to, you know, the internet, and all of a sudden we have a network. And we don't really have distributed computing though; we just have networking. And so there's a big difference between distributed computing and you know like the internet. Well, kind of there isn't there isn't. So when uh, and I'm actually kind of Skipping ahead on my slides, but I really haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> with the, you can you can stare at these guys. Here we go. <laughs> so with the, uh, <clears throat> in the old days in the original, we would buy maybe I don't know five six Unix boxes for a company, and you stick the Unix boxes out there, and somebody sits at the Unix box, a secretary, admin, and she does her work on the box, answers the telephone, brings up an application, and then somebody else sitting next to her has a screen. And that's logged into the same box. And then, you know, two doors down, two, two uh, you know, everybody has these screens. These screens are terminals, essentially. Well, the terminals are all logged into the same box. So we have one box that's servicing, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 employees in the company. And so we also have people who are working on those boxes that don't have terminals, that are working, doing, running background jobs, um, doing system maintenance, uh, who are logging into those boxes. So it's kind of a funny phenomena because, you know, nowadays, um, you know, the secretary, the admin who was sitting at the desk would go home at night and shut the computer off. You know? In fact, we still have people doing that, which is kind of weird. And, you know, because they think, oh, this is my computer. You know, and I'm using this computer. And so at the end of the night, you know, oh, let's conserve energy. Let's just shut it off. Well, if you shut a Unix box off, you've probably taken down half the company because it's not your computer. It's like not the concept of it being a desktop computer is kind of wrong. It's not really a desktop computer. It's the entire co half the company is using that, and it might be, be might be being used for the web server. The web server might be running on that computer, uh, or something that needs to to be backed up at night, or somebody's file system. Somebody else is logged into it, which is kind of interesting. Um, so when you do that, you've got multiple processors essentially, and all those processors are being used for different jobs. So when you distribute and basically what I'm describing is a distributed computing environment, you build in sort of a I don't know, farm or you, you build in sort of a factory of boxes where you have more employees when you just buy another box. You know? So you kind of figure out well, what the workload is, what the traffic is for all of your employees, and you buy the number of boxes, you know, divide it out by heads per box, and uh, some, sometimes you know, your network has four, five, six stations on it, and it just grows and it can shrink, so it's scalable as well. It's not like everyone who comes on gets a new computer. They're just getting a new terminal. It's a screen, essentially, and a keyboard. And that's actually called a thin client, is what that is referred to. And we're going back to that, actually, um, with mobile phones and things that act like clients that don't actually have that much processing and they aren't really doing anything. Uh, but long story short, um, these guys revolutionized the concept by giving us the distributed, well, it's written in C. And it was a development environment that turned into a distributed development environment where they can share work and have multiple people working on the same system together and then share processors. So you can have one program running on several different machines or pieces of the program running on different machines 
And so things could run faster. So you could develop, run programs, process information, and run your company essentially on these Unix boxes, which is kind of the purpose of Unix to begin with. And then along came the, you know, the PC. You know, this was long before the personal computer came out. And then the personal computer came out, and people say, well, you know, you now you got this box. Well, now it's a computer, and now it's going to be like you know sitting on people's desks. So then they're cheaper. I mean, actually, right now you could buy a PC, you could buy a notebook computer for what you know, two hundred dollars or something. A lot cheaper than ten or fifteen grand, which is probably the current price right now for a Unix box. So companies started stripping it out, and what ended up happening is they lost, they lost the ability to back things up. They lost the ability to share files across different you know, different computers, and they separated the data out into, you know, 200 different laptop computers that got stolen, or they died, or they broke, you know, and uh, they lost data. So then we've actually gone 360 degrees back. Now we have servers, <laughs> so, and we're doing uh, cloud computing, which is essentially going back to distributed computing, taking and getting, like, five or six different Unix boxes, and putting a cloud on them, and then having all the users log into the cloud with their dumb terminals. But now their dumb terminals are cell phones and tablets, and you know maybe there's maybe they're notebook computers. You know there's there's something that uh, it's not smart. It's not. I call them dumb because they don't need processors. You don't need a strong processor for it. I should say. You need a keyboard. You need a mouse, perhaps. You need a window, you know, a screen. That's about it. That's pretty dumb. You don't really need very much outside of that. They also call them thin because they don't have hard drives. A thin, a true thin client doesn't have a hard drive on it. A dumb terminal doesn't have anything outside of a network connection and a screen and a keyboard. Uh, so we've actually gone 360 degrees in the in the year 2012, and especially with the you know the invention of the cloud, we went from servers to computers back to servers. So now everything is stored on the Linux system. So now, even though you know we've got you know, you know the buzzwords like cloud out there, now well, what's a cloud? It's a Unix environment. It's a distributed computing environment. We have cloud space. We have cloud applications and services and things. So we kind of, now now it makes Unix more relevant. You know, for a long time people stopped studying Unix. You know, what do you need Unix for? We got Windows. It's like okay, but you know now you, you know so. Even if you're working with modern day cloud, you gotta have something about Unix in your background. Otherwise, you can't run a shell script. You can't. You're root, you're working on a Unix box essentially. So, anyway, going back to the slide set, kind of gave you a little summary, a history of where we were, where we've gone to, and now we're back to it. So we've take, taken a, a jump. So 1972 is this kind of slide you've been staring at. Looks like here, Dennis Ritchie wrote B, and then. Came up with C after that. So, and in terms of the generation of programming languages, C was kind of the end of that kind of. Well, I don't know. I should say we have C plus plus, but that's kind of different than C. I mean, that's object-oriented languages. C was pretty much the last Unix language out there. So we have scripts that support C. You can, in fact, every Unix build's got GCC on it, open source C compilers and stuff. We have the concept of the pipe where we write a program to do something and then we do it, you know, hopefully they do it well, we write programs to work together, we pipe information back and forth between the programs because we want to share. We want to share applications, we want to share utilities and programs and things. So uh, we programs can handle text streams because there's a universal interface between the different programs uh, that's created with this pipe concept. So bringing Unix to the desktop. This is where Linux comes into play. Uh, Unix is very expensive, as I mentioned before. It runs on big old machines. Microsoft DOS was the was the mainstream OS. Uh, was then we had Windows, and then we had Minix and tried, but you know not a full port. Minix was a kind of a minimized Linux version or Unix version, and then we have Open Source Solution, and we came up with Open Source Linux. So that's why I kind of say in the beginning, Unix really isn't open source. It's made by manufacturers of huge, huge mainframe computers. Or, I mean, huge, big old servers, server systems. Linux is open source. Hmm. Most of the software on Unix depends on what you're looking at. A lot of it's very expensive, actually. 
because you have to have custom built applications to run on HP UX or Sun OS. And these applications, you know, take skilled Unix people to create. And they're not sold by everybody in America. There are or in the world. There are only one or two companies buy them. So they're extremely expensive. And they're expensive to maintain and support. Linux, on the other hand, everybody's got Linux. And everyone's supporting it. And we have people that are, um, are out there writing open source stuff. So Linux applications are cheaper than Windows applications. And anyone who has you know, found themselves in a bind and went, well, I don't have Microsoft Office. Well, you can get openoffice.org. Almost as good as Microsoft Office now. Runs on Linux. And also runs on uh, Windows now, too. But it was originally an open source Linux uh, kind of port of Microsoft, Microsoft software. So back in Linux 0.02, that was actually going back down memory lane again here. 1991, so from 72, 80, 90, that's 20 years later. It took about 20 years to come out with Linux. So you uh, you can read the quote. These are see, these these slides have some pretty interesting quotes on them. They kind of when I run and read it, I go oh. So Linus, the only thing really to get important to take note of this quote if you read it is the who wrote it. So this is the Godfather of Linux which is not Dennis Ritchie, it's Linus, which, you know, comes up with Linux. <laughs> so the name actually comes from this guy's name. So Linus uh, Torvalds, if I'm saying that right, Torvalds, or something of that nature. Or Linus, everyone remembers that, because Linux, Linus. Uh, so he's actually the one that kind of came up with the Linux concept. It wasn't really, didn't come from C, it did not come from Dennis Ritchie. Uh, it was, came from this guy who ported it over. So I still maintain monolithic kernel in 1991 according to this one. Fundamental error. Well, I'll talk about monolithic kernels. We'll talk about kernels uh, before this lecture is over with. But the concept being, um, you know, which is just you can get a, you, you would not get a high grade for such a design. Huh? Well, <laughs> a lot of everything they said in the past, some of that stuff was, uh, came true and some of this stuff was irrelevant and some of the stuff they were really wrong about. It's kind of like the, uh, when the first uh, PC came out, they were, who's going to use this? Why do people want this? You know, now everybody has one. So, so 1990, the movers and shakers, Rich Stallman, father of GNU Project. This guy actually writes some really good textbooks. He has one of the best operating system books out there. It's, um, he also writes a lot of programming language concept books. Um, if you ever run across a Stallman text, uh, it's it's far above average. It's, it's better than a lot, of, a lot of the authors out there. Because uh, the guy's really experienced. And so he came up with the GNU project. What is GNU? Open source. You know, it's, kind of, it's, it's, a, it's an off um, spring of open source, essentially. It's the ability to share. So you have a group of programmers who are all working together, who are all developing for the effort of computing. And uh, for borrowing or being able to access source code, they contribute. And so there's a GNU license, I'm sure you've seen them, on a lot of software, uh, that, uh, you know, gives credit and says that, hey, this is open source, which means you can't make it for profit. You can't take GNU software and put it inside something and sell it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, which makes open source open source. It makes it open. It makes And it keeps Linux and Unix, uh, well, I should just say Linux at this point, free and cheap and affordable uh, versus Microsoft, which is a for-profit company who sells products. So. And here's a Linus Travel is a Travelis is a, the maker of Linux, essentially. So why Linux Unix? Why is it still being used? Well, is it still being used? It is still being used. I mean, I just mentioned the cloud a few minutes ago. That's the basis. It's a Unix cloud. In fact, the internet is Unix. <laughs> You log in from your Windows box and you do a Unix translation, which is why if you've ever gotten a MacBook, you might notice the internet actually runs a little faster. Because there is no translation, you're going Unix to Unix, which brings up an interesting concept about Microsoft versus Mac and versus other desktop operating systems. MacBooks run on BSD Unix, one of the original actual builds from Berkeley. It's Berkeley Unix, actually. Uh, so it's a separate breed of it. That's the core of the operating system. Microsoft Windows runs on MS-DOS, Microsoft DOS. Before we had Microsoft DOS, we had PC-DOS, and we had Dr. DOS, and we had all these DOS, which stood for Disk Operating System. Because we're talking about the history of the Linux, so we might as well talk about the history of DOS as well. Uh, it was a command line interface, obviously. You know, everyone 
you guys remember DOS? You guys still use DOS, right? I was I was over at um, I was over at another college talking to undergraduate students and they're like DOS? What is that? I never heard of DOS. Like, like how in the world did you ever make you know how in the world do you not hear of DOS? So you know there's a little icon on the desktop that says DOS on it, you know, MS. You know, okay. All right. So MS DOS was Microsoft's version of it. We had uh, in the beginning it was part of GNU project actually, the port to Intel processors, the port to desktop computers. Well, we got this real fancy little desktop because this is before notebooks came out. What do you do with it? Well, you got to load something on it. So the DOS port was sort of the stripped out command prompt that you got with Linux, which is kind of interesting because this took a 360 degree turn. So Unix started out command prompt. It's got a command line interface. What would you do? You memorized a bunch of commands, you know, ls and bi and stuff. Yeah. Everything was command run. And then DOS comes out, and DOS is command based. And then Microsoft picks it up, creates Microsoft DOS, right? And then we have Microsoft Windows. Do you remember 3.0 Microsoft Windows? You typed in win. You went to a, you booted to a DOS property and typed in win, win, and you press return. And you could escape out of Windows. It was an application that was loaded on top of DOS. Still is. Windows 7 is still an application loaded on. In fact, you can stop Windows 7 and go to a DOS prompt. You can actually take it off and go to a DOS prompt if you wanted to. Um, you can get to a DOS prompt, which a lot of people think is a shell, but it really isn't a shell. You're going back to the underlying operating system that's underneath the Windows. What's the Windows? Well, in the Unix people, they call that a desktop. So it's a desktop that's loaded on top of MS-DOS. Linux is the same thing. We have the kernel, we have the underlining, but they don't call it MS-DOS. It's not MS-DOS, it's, instead it's Linux. And we have a desktop that we load on top of it. So we can put Grom on there, KDE, tons of little desktops. Some of them actually look like Windows now, which is weird. So, In fact, if, you, uh, if you're interested in using Ubuntu, a lot of people, I actually, I, I'm, I'll, at the, when I get done with this lecture after lunch, I'll show you Ubuntu. It looks like MS, it looks like, looks like Windows, actually. It looks like Windows 7, actually. It's nice. A little taskbar and stuff. In fact, you can get desktops for Linux that look like the Mac OS, that look like Windows 7, that look, you know. And uh, well, what advantage do you have? Well, you're not using Microsoft, which means you don't have to buy Microsoft software. Uh, you can buy Linux software, or better yet, you can download it for free. Everything, most of the stuff is open source. So it's a little cheaper. Plus, it's nice for development. Hard to develop on MS DOS. That's why a lot of people buy MacBooks for C programming, for Perl, for PHP, for Python, for any programming you want to do. Much easier on a MacBook than it is on a Windows system. Because what you're doing on a Windows system is you're running on top of MS DOS. You got your Windows desktop on there. Then you got to load another emulator on top of that. You got to put on a UC something or other. You got to put on Linux shell if you're going to do anything in terms of C. You're going to program in C. You're going to run it Visual Studio. You know, if you've ever noticed how slow that thing runs, well, it's loading up an environment. It's simulating. And then now it's all integrated with .NET, which is not compatible with anything else, by the way. It's just if you're going to do Windows development, you're going to do Windows development. That's it. You're not going to be doing development for other platforms because uh, it's a total separate breed in itself. If you do Mac development, you can do development for many other. You can do Linux. You can program in threads. You can write Linux programs on a MacBook. You can write internet applications and things on a MacBook. Um, you know, Java is pretty much the same on a Windows machine as, as it is on a MacBook. But uh, the interesting thing is that because the MacBook doesn't write on top of MS-DOS, it writes actually on top of BSD Linux Core, it's more compatible. Bottom line, developers prefer it because, and I can show you, you know, we can go to a terminal prompt and you can actually run Linux commands. And you have a Linux build essentially installed on it. So if you're taking this course and you have a MacBook, which I see some of you do, you don't have to install anything. You got everything you need for this course. You can do all of the assignments, everything on your MacBook. So if you have a Windows machine, you're going to have to boot your system up to a Linux version, to a Linux prompt. You might, some of you might actually do a dual boot and actually install it, which uh, might actually be fun. So I've done that to old computers, actually, you know, with outdated computers that don't run Windows 7 or something. Like, ah, put it, put a, install Linux on it. It's a nice little Linux box.
All right, so why use it? Is this still around 30 plus years of development? Tons of development, going back to the reason why people like it, actually. Um, development tool, more uh, many academic scientists, system tools, development tools, GCC compilers, free, Perl, you know, all of those other languages that I mentioned that are open source languages. So if you're doing internet development, you're doing any type of programming, Unix is your home. You know, you're not going to do this on a Windows box, unless you're getting into .NET, and then you're on a separate, which actually kind of, kind of brings up a separate kind of Windows topic in terms of Linux. Windows Microsoft actually has a Microsoft server, and they actually have their own breed of Unix, Linux, not compatible with everybody else, which is weird. So you take, you know, in terms of compatibility, which... You know, either you're a Windows house or you're not, <laughs> because <laughs> if you go the Windows route, you're stuck. You're stuck on .NET clients, and you're stuck on Microsoft servers, because you can't run Microsoft clients on non-Microsoft, uh, you can't connect them to non-Microsoft servers. And, you know, if you do the database route, you got to take Microsoft server, SQL server. I mean, you got to go Microsoft for everything, your database, your server, your hardware, your client interface, you're stuck. There's more mixing and matching with other operating systems, and especially in terms of, you know, going with something more generic. And actually, I call it generic. It really isn't generic, but HP or Sun. Sun's pretty the, the generic system of choice these days. And in fact, I would almost venture to say about at least 70% of the Internet is on Sun. It's all Sun servers. So when you log in, you're logging into a Sun server, most likely. 70% chance, I want to say. Yeah, probably higher these days, but yeah. I, that was a statistic I ran into like a couple of years ago, so I'm pretty sure it's like 90% at this point. Because <laughs> so, they're good, they're nice, good, solid systems, and they last forever. So scalability, lightweight, easy development, some basic stuff. As I mentioned before, we have the command line interface, so it interacts with uh, Unix and Linux. It's based on entering commands in a text terminal. Not so much. In fact, I'm going to show you uh, as soon as I will. Probably I won't do it till after lunch, but uh, or maybe before. It looks just like Windows. It's just as easy to run a desktop and have it load up. And I'll show you Ubuntu actually. I have it in a virtual box. I have Windows in a virtual box too as well, loaded on this thing. That um, looks just like Windows, so there's no need, you know, to worry about the command. But in the old days, people were really worried about the command, command line prompt, because they had to remember stuff, which is kind of interesting, because now we've gone full circle. We went with Unix. Then we went with DOS, and then we had Windows on top of DOS. And then now we have Sun OS, Sun Windows on top of the command line prompt. Yeah, so now everything is graphic, everything is GUI. And so the OS X is the BSD desktop that runs on top of a BSD system on a MacBook. So it's kind of interesting. Everything's now gone from command line away from Unix back to Unix, and now. Windows gave us, Microsoft gave us the GUI, pretty much. Well, depends on who you talk to. Some people think it still comes from Xerox Park, but uh, it probably does. But, you know, there's a nice little thing on the, it's, it used to be on the Discovery Channel, and it was also on Channel 9 years ago. It's like the history of the Silicon Valley. You know, it shows the whole, it's actually for Unix course, that's not a bad read, actually. It's not a bad movie to watch, because uh, it totally gives you much more history than I just gave you. But it takes two hours to go through that history. So. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting to see how Windows was developed and how the whole GUI kind of revolutionized. And the concept of the mouse and everything kind of just changed computing in general. But we've gone all the way back around. We're back on Unix now, or, and we're still using desktops, which is cool. So. so sometimes there are no warnings with commands, no undo, no features, no buttons, no, no colorful icons either. We have to memorize commands, and users don't like to memorize commands, which is why everyone loved Windows. You know, just click on the stuff, and it ran stuff. It was easy, right? So, Actually, for a while, people were thinking that the Mac was easier, and it was easier until Windows got better. So, uh, Mac, Mike, Apple took some Windows peoples away for a while, but now they're, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with them. So, and They're taking the tablet people now. So. Uh, so the shell, the concept of the shell. So the user environment uh, that enables the interaction with the kernel at a low-level operating system. Windows Explorer would be the shell for Microsoft Windows, probably. Yeah, 
they tried to integrate the Explorer, if you remember that version. I think it was the one right before, I think it was uh, right before XP. It was like the start of XP. The Windows Explorer was part of the, you know, the, uh, well, we still have the Explorer, but it was part of the browser. And they try to, they still trying to do that, where you can go to a, you know, a Windows screen and the browser, is it like a file manager or is it like a Windows browser, you know, or is it like an internet browser? You know, like that distinction was kind of blurred. It still is kind of, because you can get address bars that look like URLs on the top of your uh, folder icons and stuff. Huh? In Linux, Unix environment, the concept is you're always connected anyway. You were networked. So there was nothing about being off the network. You were always on the network. So it was kind of funny how uh, DOS and Windows had to get on the network. You know, now they're they're gone full circle, so they're on the network all the time. In fact, if you have a Windows computer and you're not on the network, you're hosed. Because your computer's going to be trying to update constantly and trying to do stuff because it relies on that connection. Which is kind of, you know, kind of an everyday kind of observation. So common shells in a Linux Unix environment, we have the SH shell, the original Unix shell, still located in bin sh. We had the bash shells as Unix shell written for a GNU project installed on most Linux systems. We got the C shell model after the C programming language allowed you to write programming language statements. You can print F, you know, and scan F, and you can use C commands in the shell prompt. T shell, shells with modern improvements such as the file name completion. We had so many shells, in fact, we, this is just a small list. These are the common ones that are still in existence. So one of your programs for this course is you're going to write your own shell. So you'll get to write your own C shell. And uh, it's not a bad experience because that's what everybody did. That was like the desktop without the GUI. So you made special commands, made it easier for the user. You kept a history of the commands so you could go through the history. You had some automated tools you put in the shell, and then we had a dozen of these shells out there. And imagine what happened with that. I don't remember all these shells, you know. What if we had like a dozen desktop versions of Windows? Well, we do, sort of, but then people are down to one or two, you know, <laughs> XP or 7 right now. But what if you had like, add 20 more onto there? Eventually people are just going to all do the same thing, so they're all equivalent, and when you, then what do you have left with one desktop? So. What ended up happening with the shells is that everybody's shell was starting to look the same. Well, so-and-so is supporting this command, and so-and-so uses that command, you know, and all of a sudden everyone's supporting everybody else's shell. They're all the same. There's no difference, really, in the shells. <laughs> so, I mean, the only significant difference would probably be with the C shell these days, but everybody supports C in terms of the shell interface. And uh, you find out the shell. In fact, the shell commands actually work on a MacBook. You can find out the shell. Uh, no, I don't have my terminal load loaded. I'll do that later when I actually go to the shell and run some shell commands. Um, actually, I'm going to do that now. You can find out the shell. So if I go to a terminal prompt on my MacBook, and I've made the, the, the window a little bit bigger, you can run like ls as, as an example for you know a list of the directory. You know, and then Windows is equivalent to the Windows dir. You can type in shell. And you get to shell. You can type in whatever supported bash. I can go to bash shell. And what I'm doing is loading a shell on top of a shell on top of a shell. So I can exit. What I did was I just I loaded actually two different shells. And uh, I can exit. I can go back. You know, just typing in exit. Well, now I'm back to this shell. Now I'm back to that shell. Until I can eventually exit out completely. But the concept of the shell is interesting. It is not the same as going to a DOS prompt. When you go to a DOS prompt from Windows, you're going to the underlying disk operating system for the PC that you're on. When you shell, you're going to a different session on your Unix box. And that's how we get 20 people all sharing one box. Going back to what I was originally saying, they have shells. They have terminal interfaces, they have desktop interfaces, they have sessions. Some of them are local, some of them are remote, you know, some of them are from a, two blocks down, some of them are from like right in front of the box. So here when I opened up shell, I have a shell that's a login, that's an account, eh, that's doing something. So if I opened up another window here as an example, I have two shells. This shell can be on this computer. I have two shells on one computer right now opened up. 
They don't have to be. In a Unix, in a real Unix environment, these could be on one computer, or they can be on different screens, and what they are, they're different sessions. So when you Telnet, which is, comes from the old, you know, original days, you open up a shell, and your shell is your interface to the box. So this could be one user on one computer, this can be another user on another computer, all sharing the same processor here. This is a desktop computer, I only have, but I, it, you could actually log into my computer, you could Telnet, if I opened up the port on this computer, <clears throat> you could Telnet in and open up a shell. And the shell is your window or your session into the computer, and in the shell, you can load a desktop. You would have a GUI. It would look like your computer, essentially, but it's not your computer. You're remotely logged into another computer or something. Yeah. So that's why when you put the Unix boxes, in fact, they don't do it anymore. In the old days, they used to put the Unix servers out on the admins because it's a big old box. Where are you going to stick it, right? So you stick it out, and then the admin turns it off. Well, now they lock it so you can't touch it. You can't turn it off. Because you turn it off, you lost your web server, you lost your financial co program, your database, everything, because it was all loaded on that computer. And most of the company logged into it. You know, all the stations, all the terminals, everyone's logged in. If you're logged in, what do you get? You get full directory structure, which is, and it, the reason why I have this up here is I kind of want to show you, you know. There's an entire directory structure on here. Oops. Let's just go PWD. It's the root. And so people go, well, you know. When you're in a DOS window, and you open up a DOS window on a MS-DOS computer, and you're one user, you're the same user, and you're the same You're sharing the same file structure. You're sharing the same hard drive. You're sharing everything is the same. It's not session-oriented. Although Windows does have user accounts and user directories, their approach to the entire concept was to make it, what is it, my documents or something? No. Um, Direct uh, documents and settings, or something like that. There's a they they created in Windows XP, I believe. They each user has their own documents and settings, and then you have to go through. And it's all on the same hard drive, and it's all on the same computer. And so all the users are pretty much sharing all the same files. Not the case with Unix, because this mapping that you have, and this is a good example of it actually, starts with the root. And then you've got the user level that comes up from that. Well, this might be on this computer. It is, actually. But if I were to log into a, another Unix box, it might be on, and so I say I have five servers. It might be on, I might be having part of my file stored on server number one, part of it on server number two, part of it on server number three, because it's distributed. Certain applications that I'm going to be running are going to be on different locations. So if you think of the concept, this hierarchy of the directory structure isn't the same as a Windows directory structure. It's not your partitioned hard drive. Instead, it's a partition of five different servers, and you're mapped. So you're, you, have a, you have a logical environment space that looks the same for you every time you log in. Somebody else has a totally different one that looks the same for them, and they can't touch your stuff. They don't even see your stuff. They have no idea what files you have. They, they can't go in and touch it, essentially. It's protected. So a lot of people go the Unix route because not only does it put everything all on the same computer, even though it gives you have the, each user it looks like you have your own, your, own, your own environment, essentially, set by your login and your mapping. And you have your own shell, and you have basically looks like you have your own computer. But it's centrally located, so you can back it all up. And not only that, but you can centrally manage it. So you can have a system administrator come in, create user accounts, create login scripts, give users access to certain programs, and don't give them access to other programs. So not everybody has the same computer. I mean, they're not all using the same computer. They're using their version of whatever it is or what game rights do. So Unix, when we think about it, has the ability to set for every user different programs, different logins, different shells and this particular example showing us the uh, the environment variables that are set as well and I guess I'll just run this for you so you can kind of see in the uh, Linux world we set environment variables one of them is the shell that we're going to use and this is I believe a bash shell but I'm going to find out real quick actually because it should be stored in my environment variables so if I load up actually let's just get rid of this I wanted to show you the command and run it for you so you can sort of see what's going on here here it is <clears throat> so if I typed in uh, echo 
and this will work, hopefully. After, after I said it, if I actually have the environment variable set, let's see. Here it is. It's going to tell me what my shell is. And my shell, see, we're already running, on day number one, we're already running Linux commands. <laughs> we're looking at the environment. In fact, uh, let's see if print env works, actually. Yep, it does. If we type in print env, in fact, let me go back up there so you can just see what I did. It's not, uh, on my computer, it's not, this is BSD Linux. It's not case sensitive. On some systems, it actually is case sensitive. Unix and the command prompt is case sensitive for the most part. Um, but this is a hybrid version of it. It's a Linux slash underlying Apple version of it, of, BS, of Berkeley Unix. So, in fact, I think the dir command actually works in this. Uh, so my shell is not case sensitive for certain things. But I'm just going to what I just typed in. Was I typed in print env for environments. So one of the things we do in Linux, and we don't do in the Mac, well, we do it in the Mac. Excuse me, we do it on the Windows box. If the old days when people used to set their path, and they used to, you know, when you booted up Windows, you had an auto exec dot bat file, and you had a config dot sys, and you had, you set your path, and your path configured your system for you, or you know, kind of made things available so you can run them from anywhere on your computer. Well, take that and times it by a thousand in terms of the features, and make it into a true interactive environment with the environment. And then you get the Linux environment. And the Linux environment, when you log in, you have a login script. And the login script sets your path, and it sets the environment variable. And part of the environment variable stores information about you. And one of the things that I'm showing you here is that it stores what, what shell I've been assigned to. And uh, it's coming out of the shell. So if I go echo, you know, uh, shell, I can find out that my shell is bin bash. I'm actually using a bash shell. I can change my shell if I want to by changing my login, my my login script. And actually, it's more than just one one login. When you when you go to the terminal window, you can change that script as well. Uh, but long story short, the environment when I printed it out is going to give me all of the information that's stored. So it's more than my path, or it's more than my class path, or it's more than, you know, all those little things that you can kind of set in DOS. It's like, it's like the DOS capability of the environment times a thousand, really, because you can store a lot of stuff. So what I mean, Unix people do is they use this kind of like programming. So going back to programming for a second, because imagine this environment was created for C programmers. What do C programmers do? Well, they got integer i, float f, double d, you know, they have all these variables in programming language. So you can put your variables in your environment, and then you can manipulate your variables. And so it's like programming in a shell. So you, you know, you can say, you know, term is going to be equal to x color, and uh, shell, here's my shell, here's the command here when I typed in echo give me shell. This is a variable shell is equal to bin bash and it's used in my environment to set my configuration my properties you know, that's I guess the modern word for that um, temp directory uh, user users be hacker here that's how I'm logged in uh, command mode um, language is English you know password well, I don't have actually I took the password off so don't want to do that and then I can actually switch I can say, you know, as an example, you know, the common thing people want is supervised privileges. So if you type in, you know, SU as an example, it's going to say password. Well, okay, put my password in here. Oops, sorry. No, did I take my password off? Nope, I didn't. I, I do have a password on here, which is kind of interesting. I have to remember what it is now. Uh, long story short, I can log in as a supervisor by going SU. I can also log in as somebody else by going login space another user another user account that's on here and I can actually have like 25 you know as many users I have on here logged in simultaneously and then I can exit out of them close them down so the concept of the session is kind of important in terms of what's being accomplished with that uh, so going back to the slides here actually I'll just leave that window in the background put this back up so it's in full screen mode so you can actually see it and <clears throat> we didn't get too far through it so get smaller there we go then get that far through it. I'm here. So, <laughs> so as you can see, as I'm, we're going through, what I'm going to do for most of the course is just use my MacBook because it's it's got Linux on it. It's full ready to go. All the commands work. Uh, so you can change your shell, which means you know I was typing in different shell names. 
and I was actually loading up different sessions. And I was actually, you know, using utilizing resources on my computer when I do that. If I wanted to, you know, not load up a new session, I just want to log in with a different shell, I can change. There's a command here that says change the shell. And then change my shell from bash to s or ch. Why do I want to do that? Because there's different commands that work. So in fact, I can write my own, which is what you're going to do for one of your first assignments. You're going to write tiny shell. You might come up with a bunch of commands, actually, to automate some of the work that you're doing. And then you can just load on your shell, change your shell. And all of a sudden, you've got your own operating system, essentially. You've got your own customized shell. So shells are a dime a dozen, and people still create them. And they automate work. And they make it easy to kind of you know, go run through stuff. Another kind of thing that was kind of interesting is the man man pages. So when you, when you had a question, you wouldn't ask the man. It's man. The man is short for manual. And this, believe it or not, is still, a, this is actually, there's an internet version of this. One of the oldest manuals for Linux, because nobody memorized everything. In fact, you'll see when, you know, when you go in and you start typing in commands, there's like, you know, 25 different, see, what manual page do you want? I don't know. Let's say, what I just did is I typed in man for man. You know, this is, I have manual, well, because I have BSD Linux, I've got the manual pages. So a lot of people take it off, actually, because it frees up space. You can also get through it on the internet. And I'll show you in a few minutes, there's a web version of it as well. But it, for example, if I type in man, it's going to ask me what I want. I'm going to go man space ls. It's going to give me the manual page for ls. The manual page for ls is going to be, and this is the BSD general command manual. It's going to show me all of the you know, description of it, plus here's a synopsis of all the different switches I could possibly use with this. So I can go in, and what I've got here is I've got a more automatic more that's set up on here because I've got this colon here. And so I can go, you know, press the return, and I can go through. Um, I don't know how long this is really, but these are a bunch of all the switches that I can type on the ls command as an example. And uh, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people don't know that there's different ways of doing stuff. You know, as an example, if you typed in, you know, dir, it pretty much is the same as ls. Our first Unix command. Here we go. So list is list out the contents of a directory. Is this still going? You can press Control C to stop it. Uh, let me see if I can just get out of here. My Control C didn't work. Uh, didn't work. Let's see. Let's see. Command C. No. Okay. We'll just. I'll just keep pressing this till it gets to the end. <laughs> so. Uh, excuse that. Excuse me. Oh, you'd have to. I have no idea. You'd have to read through the man pages here. One of those is the size of the directory. Actually, I think it's minus H. But let me. Actually, I'm gonna run it real quick and find out. There we go. And finally, well, let me just close this window. Actually. Hmm. Uh, now you're testing my memory. No, I don't know what it is really. It's there's one one of the assignments actually has you run through like five or six different ls commands. You know, is, is, that, is that where you're asking the question from? Oh. <laughs> if you wanted to, however, you can actually go out to the internet here. Let me show you the internet version of this. Um, I don't actually have the link saved, but if I type in manual or man. Let's just type in man. Oh, that's going to be the Wikipedia version of it. Uh, what I'm looking for is the manual pages. So, nope, that's not going to be it. That's going to be a company. See, now we're, we're so commercialized these days. Uh, let's go this. Unix. Unix manual. There's a couple of reasons. Here's the online Unix manual pages. Here we go. This is the man. This is this is the graphical user interface for those people who don't like command prompts. And you just saw a few minutes ago, you know, pressing more, pressing return on that is just kind of tedious. But you can look stuff up if you go to ls here. You can say, well, here's the ls command. Here it is down here on the bottom. And then I can see this is the same page. Let's make this a little bit bigger. This is that same page that I kind of thumbed through a few minutes ago. You know. I, command prompt. Well, the concept was it was, you know, loaded. You go to a terminal, you opened up a session, you can, and that was the way you did it. Um, in fact, you can bring it up in an HTML format as well from the same prompt. 
uh, but I hesitate hesitate to actually do that. So if I want to see, for example, what, what was your question? You wanted to see directory size. Well, let's see what happens when I search on it. <laughs> so let's see. Directory. Well, let's see. If I spell it right, let's just go here, size. Size. Uh, hmm, I don't like that one. Let's go to the next one. Use bytes for blocks. Here we go. Uh, human readable. Human readable, that's the H that I thought would bring up the size, but it didn't actually. With the minus L, print sizes and human readable. Okay, that's not what I want. Um, anyway, you can go through the manual page here. Oh, minus K. I actually believe minus K is it, but let me just check out real quick. No. Okay. So anyway, this is how people look stuff up in the past. This is how they figured stuff out. The reason why I'm sort of showing this to you is because you have a couple of assignments. They're going to have you... You know, what is the command to do this? What is the command to do that? All the answers to all those questions are in the manual. <laughs> so you can get to the manual by the website. You can get to the manual by typing in man. And you can figure out what the switches are and stuff like that. And they call them switches, like parameters that you set. So that's going to help you significantly uh, with one of your, actually a couple of your assignments, actually. Um, and in a way, the way I got to this was I, in fact, this is from, this is the UK version of it. Um, I just did a Google search on Unix manual, which is how it came out. So let's go back to the PowerPoint that's still in the background here, I believe. Hello. Okay, let me just bring it up manually. Close that one down. There we go. All right. So uh, reading the manual, nobody reads the manual. They use it like a dictionary or like a lookup glossary. So you can go manual minus K keyword, for example. And you can, based on the keyword, you can actually, you know, look at stuff. Most of the commands uh, have a built-in Unix manual. Even the man command actually has a manual for it. And so you can get the manual on the manual if you wanted to. You can also get help with it by using the minus H uh, or the minus or the forward slash, excuse me, forward slash with the question mark. And you see a lot of Unix utilities uh, that are written with the same kind of format. So everything has a minus H switch. And minus H gives you the help. It shows you how to run the command normally. So. Keep in mind, however, man, manual pages includes not only all the basic Unix commands, Unix, Unix commands, but if you install software such as OpenOffice.org or something like that, you'll get manual pages for that too. Manual pages get installed for everything that actually gets created for. So if there's a manual page for it, you'll get it, and it would just be added to your entire list. So the manual pages are divided into eight different sections depending upon the type of command you're looking at. As I mentioned before, you can get third-party tools and things loaded to it. Commands and applications would be the one of them. System calls, and I'm going to be talking about that today as well. C library functions. Actually, it's not bad for uh, programming, actually. You can get manual pay. It's, well, Linux is C. So on printf and scanf and all those little C commands. Uh, four special files. Uh, five would be file formats. You can get the manual pages online, games, miscellaneous, system administration, utilities, and things. You know, how do I you know, do a defrag or something, or F F you know, FSCK or something like that? There's a manual page on everything. So, so some conventions for this particular lecture, because what we're doing is that in the beginning is going through a bunch of commands and things and utilities. So the way that this lecture is, uh, the lecture is too short to give you all of the options that are available. I'm not going to, in fact, that would bore you to death to sit there. In fact, if you have a computer, you can go to a, actually, see you guys, you can go to your terminal prompt and try this stuff, this stuff out while you're doing it. However, uh, you're going to, there's a lot more than I'm not going to show you. If I went through every single Linux command, not only would you be bored, but uh, it wouldn't accomplish anything because you're not going to remember it. No one memorizes this stuff. What people memorize is what they use most often. So, and I'm going to show you the most often ones, which is just a handful. So, commands will be in bold in this lecture. And uh, options will be in italics. So it's going to look like this, the command with the italics next to it. And so uh, the output uh, will be shown in its own uh, border table. So here we go. So uh, some basic common conventions. So in terms of the help files, as we've seen, and the manuals themselves, commands will have the required input and option, out, it, excuse me, required input and option input. So the option here says, well, it's optional. It's, it's, it's not optional, it's the option. So 
This is a CP command as an example. So CP is a copy command. So if you're familiar with DOS, a lot of them have the same kind of naming convention to it. If you typed in the CP, CP command, it's expecting two, two optional, well not options, but two options that go along with it. We need the source and we need the destination. So the options here, the optional arguments are in the brackets here. that say this is the option. And required ar arguments are not. So we could say CP uh, source destination, well that's actually not required, but this one is required. So one of the things you run into is people like run commands their own special way by shortcutting, which is what you're going to end up doing and learning in this course actually is how to shortcut. Because not only can you string a bunch of commands together, and we saw the, the word pipe earlier, but that's the technique that we're using to pipe input from one command to you know, go into, a, you know, output from one command, go in as input into another command. Um, so one of the, one or two of the assignments is going to have you look with, you know, work with piping, finding, um, truncating stuff, moving stuff, creating directories, and all sorts of different things. Kind of get you familiar with navigating through the Unix system. So the CP minus R as an example is for recursive. You know, copy this and everything underneath it for this directory to the other directory. And, um, we have short versions of it, long options that are associated with it as well. Um, so we could say minus R or we can say minus recursive. Yeah, so people end up with their own style in terms of the way that they run these commands um, because there's more than one way of running it and everything works you know, theoretically yeah, if you type the command correctly. So whose path is it anyway? So I kind of um, alluded to this concept for you when I first brought up the terminal window. <clears throat> but uh, Unix treats a directory structure as a hierarchy of hmm, individual paths, which is kind of interesting because if you take a look at this as an example, and you go, well, we got dev, user, home. Off of home, I got bhacker, right? Yeah, I got user, and I got bin, right? And then it looks like Windows, kind of, doesn't it? And most people argue with me for the first week or so, and they go, oh, yeah, it's just like Windows, right? If I mounted another disk, in fact, uh, I have a USB drive. If I can have to go dig through and find it, it's going to be in here at a mount point into the directory structure, but it's a totally different disk. So we have one global hierarchical structure that works and gives us our path and our environment, but it spans over multiple drives, multiple disks. If you did that with a Windows system, well, can't do it with a Windows system. <laughs> so if you have a hard drive on a Windows system, you have files that are loaded on the Windows hard drive. If you take the hard drive out of the computer, the hard drive has on it all of the files that you have stored on it, right? So theoretically, one hard drive has one directory, right? How does the directory span over multiple hard drives? Can't. But in Unix, you can have 20 hard drives, and you can have one directory with one file that spans over 20 of them. So you can have larger files. <laughs> so you can have, okay, so video editing. You know, most of it's done on huge MacBooks or huge supercomputers with, well, because Mac is BSD. So you can have larger files. You can have different features of the operating system that are going to support different, you know, video streaming and capture and stuff like that. Um, you know, the problem right now with video cameras in a lot of ways is like you fill up your hard drive. That's not good. So, anyway, long story short, you can put in a USB drive. If I mount it in my USB drive, it's going to show up in my directory structure just like any other directory that would be on my hard drive, but it's not physically loaded on the same hard drive. It's on a different drive. So this concept of mounting and inserting into the file system is completely unique versus the Windows system. In fact, I'm waiting for Windows to come up with this, but they haven't, actually. You can slip a USB drive in on a Windows system, and you see a little icon that shows up. Actually, get this on the Mac as well. A little icon that shows up on the desktop. You double-click on it, and there it is. There it is. But on the Unix system, you can actually use a mount command, mount it in the directory structure at a mount point, read and write to that mount point, and hopefully the drive is actually inserted is what ends up happening is people take the drive out and they're reading and writing to the mount point but there's no physical drive connected anymore because they accidentally removed it for some reason and then they lost their files actually but you know, in that particular case hopefully you get some sort of an error that says you know, you know 
you, know, you do get an error actually when you try to write it's like write protected or something it's like I can't write can't save the directory listing but theoretically what you're doing is you're just adding physical devices into the same directory structure and you only have one directory structure and the directory structure starts out with a global root so you log in a Unix server you got root and then you got all a bunch of other stuff where they're physically located who knows they're all on they're distributed out over five sunboxes they're not all one computer so Anyway, it's just one of the biggest differences in terms of the directory structure and how it's treated as a hierarchy of individual paths. So the directory, you know, it's our working directory. Well, actually, I may have even showed you that already with the pwd command. So, and the ls command. So if I typed in pwd, it's going to say, you know, what is my what is my working directory essentially? So, and this works here. Say if I type in pwd, well, it's users b hacker. So, and if I have it. Where's my, well, at the break, I'll find my USB. What I normally do is I plug in the USB drive and I go mount, you know, and I mount it into the, and then we can see it in the directory structure. And then I pull it out and we can say, well, look, it's still in directory structure, although it's not physically connected. You can actually do it in a read only mode if you wanted to do it that way. Load it in, take it away, and it's still there because it's in the directory structure, not on the disk. It still is on the disk, though. Anyway, so ls, as we've seen in the beginning here, that's our first command, pwd, where are we in the directory structure, which is kind of interesting because you, sometimes you need to know because you might be doing some maintenance on another user account, you might be in the wrong user account, you're deleting files and doing stuff, and you have no idea, <coughs> which is brings up a kind of another point about this mapping concept. Multiple users can be mapped to the same directory or the same section of the disk but have a different representation of it. And we also have the concept of symbolic links and different types of directories themselves that go way above and beyond the directory concept. So Windows calls them folders. They used to be called directories, however, in the beginning. And they turned them into folders. They really are folders, if you think about it. In the Linux system, Unix, Linux, they're, they're directories. They're not folders. Because you're not sticking anything inside of the folder. Instead, you have a directory map. It's kind of like, kind of like a GPS directory. It's a route to get you to navigate through the system and it's your navigational purpose. So you can minimize the confusion for some users by mapping it differently. So they're really using the same files and they're accessing the same programs but they have the appearance of them being in different directory names and they're at different levels of the hierarchy. You know, as an example, usually the user, I have root privileges here on my computer, but usually the user doesn't get to see anything past home. So if you have a Unix account that you have, uh, let's say, for example, you have a web, I mean, how, how many people have their own web page, as an example, you can tell that into that Unix server. You're not going to be able to see everybody else's public HTML directory. In fact, you're not going to see anything past your public HTML directory. If you try to go back through the hierarchy, nah, -uh. <laughs> it's not going to let you. Uh, it's protection, actually. Why should you be messing around with somebody else's files, but there's an admin who can go through all of it through there, and their mapping will show everything. Yours is only going to show from public HTML forward, whatever it is you create on that server. Well, same thing here, actually. In fact, if you downgrade your Windows, excuse me, you downgrade your Mac privileges, put you back on a, a user, you don't see the dev, you don't see the user. All you see is your home. In fact, you're not going to see your home. You're going to see B Hacker. If you're B hacker, so you're going to see your home directory for your user. You're not going to see any of this other stuff. So in Unix, we have different access levels. So, and I'm going to go through this probably uh, later after lunch. You know, the directory access, file access, um, rights and privileges that we can stick on, and ways that we can configure the abstraction to make it easier, to make it more useful um, in terms of the purpose and what it is we're designed to do. And uh, it's done through, you know, change mod command, essentially. And it's done through system utilities to configure scripts to set directory locations and directory paths. <clears throat> so the pwd command will view the working directory that you're in. The ls command will set you, uh, list out the files that are, is in your working directory. Finding your home. Well, we can actually use this little squiggly line here. Or we can ask the environment variable, what's my home? So if I did, you know, as an example, I can, you know, in fact, I'll just, oh, I'm on the shell. If I did the print env, 
It's going to show me everything, but it's going to show me here home. Or I can just echo, echo this variable here, and this one's called home. And I'm going to see this here. And so, well, that's my home directory. And I can, you know, switch to it if I wanted to. Or I could use, you know, CD space, and I can get this little squiggly line here and goes B hacker. Oops, if I spelt it correctly. So I got a shorthand that takes me back to home, takes me back to a certain location. Um, I can do most of your directory navigation is very similar with the uh, DOS, except for in Unix we have relative and absolute paths. So I don't have to keep typing in the whole name of the directory I want to switch to. I can go dot dot. And so you'll have an entire exercise actually on directing directory navigation, which is actually kind of interesting when you look at it and go, well, oh, that's going to be a pretty easy assignment, right? You're just typing in, you know, change the directory to this, change directory. And you'll, you'll see how complicated it actually kind of turns out because the exercise is going to have you go through a bunch of, um, you know, non non common yet very useful ways of navigating the directory structure. And here's one here as an example, the tilde character here. We'll tell you, we'll tell the shell to auto complete the path statement. So we don't get this in like a Windows DOS environment. It's totally a Unix thing. Um, or looking at the home variable, the home environment variables. There's a lot of people that like to set a bunch of variables, and you can do that. If you want to remember your passwords, you know, you know, it's just a password variable. <laughs> you want to set not not such a good idea, but if you want to like set a bunch of information that you know is in your environment, go for it. Essentially, it doesn't really take up that much memory, actually. Here's some more file commands. I'm not going to, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to go through each one of them. It would bore you silly. But uh, you can certainly welcome to try these out and uh, type, you know, go to your terminal prompt, type them in, see what they do. Not a bad exercise if you've never seen the terminal prompt before, <laughs> so, which some students haven't actually. Uh, changing the directory, ls, moving, mv for moving, copying. Removing, that comes in handy. Removing recursively, as I showed you before, actually comes in handy as well. So you can get rid of a bunch of uh, things all in one shot. In fact, you can erase your entire hard drive. Easy. Just go to the root directory and remove the forward slash minus r. Most system administrators would put a, put a lock on that, hopefully, so that you couldn't do that. Because you wouldn't have privileges to do that, hopefully. If you're the root, however, which is kind of an interesting thing, so people from a Windows background, everyone's got the same privileges. Everyone's got the same computer, you know, it's my computer, you know. And actually, most Windows people only have one login that they use on their desktop. Why well, have multiple logins, anyway? You know, although you can, you can have like 20 different user accounts if you want, you know, or more. And they all have the same privileges, you know, for the most part. They have their different home directories and they have their different documents and settings and stuff like that. But in Unix, you can have, as an example, admin level, and you can set profiles for groups of users. So you can have groups of people who should not be allowed to recursively remove all of the files in the directory structure. And you can have people who are not allowed to see the payroll program, but they can see the HR program. And you can selectively configure the environment per user privileges, and then set different profiles per groups create users, assign them, and we have an exercise on that as well, but assign users to groups essentially. Here's our recursive directories, as I mentioned before, oftentimes the manual will refer to the recursive actions of a directory. So it means to perform an action on a given directory, rather it be remove, update, move, works with all directories, all actions, and recursively do it to all subdirectories, which is interesting. So. You can't delete a, you can't delete a directory that has a subdirectory with it unless you might you do the minus r and recursively or remove everything inside of it so the directory is empty and then remove it. Which is, I don't know. Was there for a reason actually? So it's, in Windows you can actually click on the directory and then press delete and it removes everything for you. It's like automated. So this is not automated. Linux and Unix wasn't made for ease of use. It was made for performance and functionality. So a lot of the automation that we take for granted for in the Windows environment was there to help us. It made it made it easier for us to use the computer. So, so you might be thinking, well, what if, well, why don't we want to learn the hard way of doing something? Well, what if, what if you're working on a cloud? <laughs> you're going, you're shelling, you're telnetting in. You got Unix. You don't have a Windows automation. 
<laughs> so you have to actually know, you know, how to actually navigate on a Unix box if you're going to do, even if you're not going to do system administration, Unix server stuff. Who knows, maybe you want to be a system admin too, who knows. Here's our relative and absolute path. <coughs> so you don't really have this either. You don't have the dot dots and the dots. Although you see it, which is interesting. If you go to DOS and you'll see inside of the directory the dot dots and the dot, but you can't navigate it. Well, you can actually in some of the earlier, some of the more recent versions of DOS you can actually. Because uh, what ended up happening with DOS eventually is they went, well, it's not as powerful as Unix, and then it became more powerful. They just keep adding more features onto that. So. So here we have a relative and absolute path, just to explain that uh, briefly here. The commands that expect you to give, give them a, a path, essentially, because we're working with, we don't have just a file. It's not a file on a disk. Instead, we're navigating the directory structure, and we're moving something from one path to another, and we're doing stuff. So most of the commands will uh, let you provide a file with a relative, or what's referred to as absolute. So we have a relative and absolute in terms of the concept. Relative means in relationship with another directory. So you're in a subdirectory structure all the time, unless you're at the root. So you're going to type in everything all the way back to the root. Nah, you're just going to change relatives to something else. On one point, relative to that point, you're going to navigate. Absolute is everything all the way back to the root. Absolutely everything. <laughs> so, which is how you can sort of remember it. You're going to do it in relationship with another directory and relative purposes, or you're going to do it absolutely back to the beginning. So, so the dot dot forward slash directory is the dot dot refers to uh, looking for in the previous file directory first. So it goes back to the previous directory. Or the dot, the single dot forward slash executable says, so, say, says this directory, or the working directory. You can actually use this when you run commands, actually. Um, fortunately, the environment variable is set in, the, uh, in this particular, actually, let's see. I should be able to, whoops, I don't know how I got a little window out of that. But uh, I should be able to use the dot and the dot dots to run things as an example. Let me see if I have anything running here. Uh, no, I don't have any executable files in here. Uh, those are all Android projects and stuff. Uh, but if I had a C program, I had a text file. Um, actually, you know, I could go dot forward and before I ran it and just say that I'm running this in this directory, but I the nano is actually not in this directory. I think I have nano on here, actually. I do. So. Nano is kind of like a text editor that comes with Unix. It's sort of uh, like BI. I shouldn't say comes with Unix. You can download it. So we'll go through that um, app get and the downloading utilities and things as we get through the course. But uh, for day number one, just showing you the command interface, I think is a, a good start. So the dot, the forward slash is basically telling you in this directory, run this file, which is different because when I did that and I did this, it didn't run. Because it, it's not in that directory, which is a little different than the in the DOS days, you know. If it was in the directory, it runs. But, you know, it's in my path, so I have a path I'm mapped to it, so I know it's going to run. And it's actually probably in, uh, it's probably off of roots, actually. It is. It's probably in bin, yes. And uh, nano's in there somewhere. For those of you who came in late, we're actually breaking at noon, which is about 20 minutes. Oops. Let's see if I can get back to my... There we go. All right, so the absolute and the, uh, the relative in terms of the directory mapping. So absolute or full paths are complete. So an easy way to know if your uh, path is complete is, uh, you know, it does it with a forward slash character at the beginning. So, so here we have a full path with the file name. We have home, user, directory, executable file which is going to be the full stuff. It does a container character, essentially. It's going to tell us whether or not we have uh, anything in there. So uh, poking around in home, we can see how much space do I have by typing in quota. And so the command itself to see quotas for directories, if, any, if there are any. Actually, I don't know if I have any. Well, disk quotas for bhacker, none. I don't have any disk quotas set. So what I can do is, you know, as I say, for example, I, uh, I have a, you know, I went out and bought a $10,000 Sun server and decided I'm going to go into the ISP business. I'm going to sell 
web space. But I don't want to give everybody 500 megabytes or something. You know, I'm going to be stingy with my web space. I can set a quota for everybody. I can say, you can only use 500 megabytes, and you can only use, and then all of a sudden, you've limited the amount of space each user can use. So the quota is going to give you that ability to essentially look at it, see, how, see what's going on, how much space you have left. I didn't set a quota. I'm using my entire hard drive. Uh, how much space am I taking up? DU or DF commands will show you how much how much space a folder or a directory uses. DF is going to be for DU. DF is going to be the display the space information for the entire system. And if I run those, I'm actually just trying to make sure that they will actually work on the, the MacBook. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So DU and DF are going to kind of give me how much is this stuff taken out? Well, I can see that uh, disk S2, which is my main disk, it's like it's at 38% capacity. Not too bad. And then I see a bunch of these other ones. And actually, this is pr probably a good good example to show you is where you can see the mounted points. So uh, if I can find my USB drive, I'll mount my USB drive in here, and I can see that I will probably have 100% capacity left on it because it'll be empty, hopefully. And I can see the mount point where it's coming in, and I could probably put it on mount MNT directory or something. Uh, and uh, I'll do that actually after lunch, and uh, I have to go find my USB drive. But uh, long story short, it uh, will tell me for each individual device that's in there as well, for the mapping point, how much disk space I have left. Um, so, because it might be important because you don't know, you don't see the disk, you don't have access to the disk. All you have access for is the information in the directory structure. So you're navigating it through the directory structure. So helpful hints on space itself. Almost all commands uh, that deal with the space uh, will display the information in kilobytes or bytes. So nobody finds really that useful. So you can do it in human readable format, which is the H. So many commands will support the minus H option for human readable, which means I'll well, put it in something I can actually understand. Right? Why put it in bytes or something? So LS minus, oh, here we go. Displays the working directory files with a long listing format using human readable notation for space. Isn't that what we were trying to do earlier? So if we typed in ls minus lh, there we go. Now we can see how much space. What's wheel? Interesting. Uh, root. I'm on root actually. How much space is being taken up by each one of my directories here? And I also see more information as well. I see the, the privileges that are set for each one of the files and directories that are set for the system. So it's a human readable format. It's all in columns, you know. It's pretty good. I think that was what the command we were looking for earlier, actually. <laughs> so see uh, minus LH to give us the disk space. So in terms of rep representing space, the byte either the one or the zero, excuse me, the bit, the byte. 8 bits. I'm not going to go through all this, but go back to uh, Computer Science 101. You know the calculations of all of the different things all the way up to a terabyte, a gigabyte, terabytes. Permissions. So the uh, we saw actually a few minutes ago the permissions. I highlighted it and I said this 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 line here at the beginning is going to show us our permissions. So the, the NX system, our multi-user system itself, uh, where many users uh, run programs and share data, well, we have to protect it somehow. So files and directories have three different levels of permissions. They have the world, you know, where they have the public world, group or user. So there's three different levels. Types of permissions a file can contain might be, and here's an example here. We saw R's and W's for reading and writing. Uh, so file permissions are arranged by three groups with three characters. So we have three characters per group, and there's three groups. So some of the extended versions actually have four because they have the other in there. Uh, so in this example, the owner can read and write a file while others have read access. So we have read access for owner, and then we have dash dash. Like they don't have access. Or we have read write for owner. Root, roots only that read, and others only have an R. And now uh, we use uh, the change mod command. And uh, this is just kind of, a, I've got another lecture that's going to, later on, it's going to go through changing things with numbers and changing things with characters and stuff. But in this particular example, we can do a change mod 
uh, to change permissions on a file or on a directory, and then a change owner to change the owner to another owner, to another user. Uh, both options support the minus R as well for recursive, recursion. So we can recursively change the owner of a particular directory to somebody else. If we do that, then we can change and make it, you know, read-write, not readable, not writable. So we can share stuff. As an example, I'm in here as a hacker and I've got a bunch of files that I wrote. And I want to share it with another user that's on my system. Well, I can change the permissions on the file or the directory and give them access to it. Or I can change the owner, make it somebody else. If I want to protect something, I'm going to change the owner to root. I'm going to leave it in my uh, root directory and uh, take away access, essentially, to it. So it allows us to customize the system a little bit, make it so that people can run files, but they can't delete it, or they can't look at it, but they can run it. Something you know. We have uh, information about ourselves. We can type in, who am I? And we can figure out, uh, you know, I'm the current user. We can change the password. So most people who tell net into uh, web sites to upload their files and use FTP, you're using a Unix server, by the way. Most of what you're going to do is change your password eventually. Otherwise, it's set on the default. You know how many people don't change their password? I'm just kinda, it's kind of funny, actually. A lot of people, in fact, people do this with routers all the time. They never change the password on a router. So why? I don't know. But, you know, you always know the default that they, you know, Netgear and everybody else uses. So. Usually you can just type in the default and it works. Uh, but this should also work here if I typed in who am I. I can see that I'm B Hacker. So and I can type in, you know, pass. I don't want to change my password, but I could do that to change my password if I wanted to. That would mess up my Windows system, I think, because I don't know what my password is right now. So, <laughs> uh, so what do we have here? Uh, just some samples on the bottom of the, uh, the screen. We could say, what is my group support? What is my group? Might be support group. So it's going to tell us the group here. So if we change the group, we actually would easy. If we do things by groups, we can just assign users to groups, and we have you know instant access. You're, oh, you're an HR person, okay? Or you're an admin person. And profile them and give them access to certain things. So uh, what is everyone else up to? So if you can go top, show a detail, refresh description of the running processes on the system. Uptime, it's an example. Uptime on my computer. Well, I've had it up uh, hmm, two hours. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm a little talkative today, so <laughs> so hasn't been up that long. Okay. Um, and I can type in other, you know, to to figure out, uh, you know, top, you know, what's running on this system. And I can figure out, well, okay, this is all this stuff. And I can see it right here. You know, change the load is very similar to going into the Windows. Um, what is it? The, not the control panel. The, uh, the, the control alternate delete. What does that bring up? The huh? task manager. Yes, task manager is what I was thinking of. And uh, seeing the real time activity, but this is a graphical. So and there's also GUIs that are built to show you that stuff. We can type in PS and see the processes that are running. Jobs. It's also supported. I don't have any jobs running as a user. PS and well, jobs is going to show me what my jobs are, but I don't have anything running. And uh, we can run programs in the foreground, we can run it in the background, and we have a, an assignment that's actually going to run through that for you as well. Actually, the first assignment that does the shell is going to go through all of that stuff. So you'll be writing, you'll be writing your own shell essentially, and your shell will have a, the ability to run programs in the foreground and into the background as well. So. So uptime, uh, the load as well. So the load is the number of based on the utility of the CPUs of the system. So a load of one indicates full load of one CPU. I didn't look at it, but uh, if you have multiple CPUs, it's going to show it two per CPU as well. So in terms of working with programs, I showed you the PS to show you the running processes that are on the system, and then jobs shows you the processes that are running per user. Um, jobs is actually not supported on all Linux builds, but PS is. That's the standard universal processing system. So commands for programs uh, on the system itself is identified by their file name and their process ID. If you go into the task manager and you click on, uh, let's say you opened up Windows Explorer several times, or Internet Explorer several times, and one of them crashed, or Microsoft Word or something. And this is, would be the equivalent of typing in PS. And uh, if you double-clicked on it and said kill, or not kill, you know, Unix would call it a kill. 
Uh, if you double clicked on it, it said, you know, remove, stop it now. Take all these Word, I have to, 20 words opened up, you know, let's close them all if you've ever done that. It's the equivalent to the Unix command kill. So everything that you can do on a Windows box, you can do on a Linux box, but you can do it better <laughs> because you have more control over it. You can kill it now, you can kill it later, you can kill it at a certain priority. You can kill processes that don't belong to you if you've got access to it, uh, which is what system administrators do. So they go in and they say, oh, this user's been running this. Oh, it's a virus. Let's just kill it. <laughs> Or something so. So the PS displays the process information on the system. Kill PID, kill this process ID, terminates the process by its ID. Control C may also terminate a program as well as we've seen a couple times. Yeah. Control D terminates your session, gets rid of your session. Why do you want that? Well, we're working on a process system. So Unix is a true multi threaded processing environment. Well, so is Windows. But Unix users and as well as developers have more control. So we can go in and look to see what processes are running, what kind of system load they're taking up. We can selectively stop them, start them, you know, run multiple processes if we want to. Um, every time we open up a session, we're taking up resources. Every time we open up a process, we're taking up resources. So a system administrator would go in and control the use of the CPU. And you know, if someone's not working fairly and someone is like uh, there's a big jo batch job well you just pause the job or you put it in the background or you put it in the foreground or you move things around so a lot of the system administrator's job is to control the processors you know what's going on and to make sure everyone's got you know usable environment to work in so only you this or the super super user root has permission to kill processes you own so you just can't go in if you don't have root privileges, you can't go in and just kill everybody else's processes. So. In fact, for the most part, I mean, you won't even know what's running on the computer. You know, you have a lot. You're, your session is your session. What else that processor is being used for? You don't know, but you know, maybe hopefully the the root user does. Advanced program options. <coughs> so oftentimes you must run a command in the background, so you can use the ampersand here. Ampersand character following the command will put it into the background. Do we have a foreground and background processes in Windows? We do, actually. The minimize. Yeah. When we open up, and for the longest time, we didn't have that, actually. Windows 3.0 didn't have it. I don't think it had it. I'm not sure. But every time you switch Windows, everything you're not working on is in the background. Whether it runs slower or not is a good question. I've never actually tested it. But in a Linux environment, you can actually give, you can adjust it. So background processes aren't taking up as much CPU, CPU utilization. So if you have, let's say, a backup, it, that can run all day. <laughs> so put it in the background. Don't give it so much resources so it doesn't affect the user environment. I don't believe you have the ability to do that on a Windows box. At all. You can put it in the background, but you can't tell. Don't eat up any resources right now. I'm trying to print something out. <laughs> no. Or you can assign a lower priority, yeah. yeah. That's just essentially what you're doing with multiple threads in the Linux environment is you're assigning priority, essentially. And you're giving a lower priority to the background. You can do that on a Windows box? Yeah. I'm not a huge Windows user. That's why I was just I was curious. I've never tried to lower a priority on a process. I don't think I can. I, don't know. I know the task manager's got a bunch of features in there. I'll have to look that up. But concept being, you know, not having it eat up all your resources. That'd be nice, actually, for those Windows updates. <laughs> I'd like to, well, I turn them off anyway, so I don't, I don't do the, I'm not a huge Windows fan anyway. But anyway, let's not talk about Windows. This is the Unix course, so let's talk about Unix instead. All right, so the, here we have the command with the options here. It doesn't run in the background. We can match zero or more characters with a wildcard. Same thing we do in the DOS, actually. Using a CP space, an asterisk was a wild card to a destiny. Copy everything, basically. So what that's going to tell you. Option gets you in trouble if misused, obviously. You know, like delete star dot star forward slash r <laughs> minus r. <laughs> so delete everything recursively. I don't think you're going to be allowed to do that, actually. I hate VI and I never use it. Why? I don't know. It's just not user friendly to me. So. I usually opt for another one called Nano, which is kind of the same thing, but it has like a little graphical thing. You're wondering, well, why in the world? It's kind of like the notepad equivalent to Windows. 
But Notepad's GUI. VI is not GUI. And neither is Nano, actually. It's a text base. And why are you doing that? Well, if you're out at a command prompt and you're writing a script and you want to edit the script, believe it or not, it's actually easier to bring up a text editor <laughs> than it is to exit out of the command prompt window, go back and open up a Notepad, a graphical user editor to go in and change something. It's, sometimes it's just a little bit easier to actually edit it from the command prompt. So people still use VI today because of that reason, actually. Um, can you still use Pico? Well, it's just Nano. Pico is a Nano version. I it's the more current version of it's called Nano, actually. So, editor originally used for an email client, Pine. Pine actually still exists. I think I actually even have Pine on here, where you can send an uh, emails text space from instead of going into Microsoft Outlook or something or into Eudora or you know Thunderbird or one of these mail programs. You can just send it from the command line. So you can use Nano to write the message and then actually send it from Nano. So it's a quick way of sending a message out. You might be wondering, well, why would I want to do that? I can just open up Microsoft Office and you know, say, use the Outlook Express or use Outlook or whatever. And it's a much better experience, right? What if you're writing a script for a backup that runs in the middle of the night and you want the script to send the email message out with the message, with the error message that actually occurs at the time that it actually occurs. Well, then you put it in a script and you use Pico or you use Nano and you actually send it out on a command line prompt automated. So a lot of this stuff here, especially, you know, editors, um, email clients, telnets, FTP, pinging, all these tools that are like, you know, people go, oh, so low tech. It's like command line. They're actually higher tech. They're not low tech. They're better than the GUI because you can put them into scripts and you can automate with them. So you can send messages in and out, you know, without ever having any user involvement at all, so, which is what admins do, especially if you're writing your own scripts. And you'll get the opportunity to write some scripts in this course as well. In fact, one of the programs has you send out, you know, a spam message to like 500 people or something like that. You certainly wouldn't want to do that with a GUI. It would be too time consuming to take you all day to write it, you know, to send all those messages out. So, But at command line, it's like accidentally you can send it out to hundreds of people with a few statements <laughs> on a command line, and all of a sudden everyone's got junk mail, So, which is what most of your spam mail is actually doing. So nobody manually sends that stuff out. There's a script that sends it out. Input and output, we'll also take a look at this in the redirection of I.O., which is kind of interesting because, you know, at the beginning when I started out this lecture, you know, several hours ago, or not too long ago. I uh, started out talking about sessions and how we have our own telnet and how we can have a window that opens up and a terminal. And the interesting thing is it's just nothing more than the input and the output from the Unix box. And we have many different users that have many different forms of input and output. Uh, so programs, commands, and actually programs themselves have their own input. Pro programs can actually act like bots. Well, they do. We have bots. Bots, you can, they have their own input and output. They have their own functionality. They're users, but they're just not real users. So, uh, so they can contain input and output. They are called streams in the Unix environment. So Unix programming is often referred to as a stream-based interface. So we have the input stream, the output stream. So programs often have error as well. So we can, and one of the things that uh, system admins do all the time is they redirect the error output to a file. My store, and they can archive it, and they can make logs. Like in a, in a, you know, two seconds, you can create your own logging system for everything. In fact, you can actually log everything a user does on a system in about two or three different lines of code written in a script. So you can have that on your Unix box, and you can see what so and so is web surfing at lunchtime or something. <laughs> by well, by copying the output or the input actually, redirecting it or by just logging it essentially. And then also logging, you know, there's, it's, there's good, to, it's not just for spying on people, you know, people will capture the errors just to see what's going wrong with the system. But standard in and you can actually, you know, use it, this is just because this goes back to C programming actually, the standard input stdio.h which is standard IO, uh, the standard input or the output from the keyboard ST, uh, SDT, standard output, uh, 
standard error. That's a typo actually on that. <laughs> so standard input, standard output, standard error is what that's supposed to be. This is a typo that T and the D needs to be moved around, but uh, I have to fix that for next time. Standard error, standard input, standard output. Going back to C programming 101. If you're not a C programmer, actually, if you are a C programmer, you understand Unix a lot better, actually, because a lot of the stuff is C based as well. So as we know that from the beginning. If you're not a C programmer and you're brand new to computer science, then Unix is kind of going to be a little bit overwhelming, I believe, to some at first. But you know, it doesn't take you that long. In fact, I personally think it's easier to learn than Windows, but we'll see. File redirection. So oftentimes you want to save the outputs from a program. So that's you know, nice when you're in a Windows system, right? You double click on something, you got the GUI, and you're looking at it. It does something, and you can see the output, right? But what if you're not there? Or what if you don't want to see the output? What if you have a program running in the background? Well, then you can save the output and redirect it to a file and look at it later after it runs. Maybe it's doing a virus scan. So most of your virus scan software is not going to show you in real time what it's doing. Instead, occasionally it's going to put a little pop-up message that comes out of nowhere. Hey, you detected this file. Or someone's trying to come in on this port. It comes out of nowhere. Well, it's still logging the information. It's redirecting it to a different source, and then all of a sudden it puts it out when you need to see it. So you can do this in Linux by uh, or Unix by uh, it's done with a redirection operator, and this is the input and the output arrow actually. So just kind of show you something real quick here. If I uh, ran a program, I use the directional arrows, and these are these are the arrows that I'm talking about here this arrow and this arrow to take something from this file and send it to that file or to take something and write it from here and send it to that so if I did an ls as an example I can go ls and then I'm going to output output it to and this is like the C and C out if you're familiar with C++ actually it's the redirectional arrow so I output it to uh, my list Access to our oh, permission deny. Oh, that's nice. It's probably because I'm in root. Let's see. So where am I? I am. I'm not in my user account. So I'm gonna go users. I probably could do it here. And actually, I'll just go back to bhacker. Here we go. So now if I go ls and I see out to uh, my list, nothing happened. Well, I redirected it. And what I did. So if I typed out or if I cat my list which is a way of typing it to the screen. I see my list. It's stored in a file, but it was really my output. And it's using that arrow here. And if I actually, I can see the history of my commands by just pressing my up and down arrow, where I can actually look at the history, because that's all logged as well. Because as I mentioned before, we can use this redirection to spy on people. Well, this is kind of a spying on me. All those commands I just did a few minutes ago are all stored in here. But that's on purpose. It's my history from my shell. My history actually stays. So, And we have a, I'll have an entire lecture on looking at the history. In fact, you'll have an assignment, actually, that'll have you go to different places in the history and run commands over again instead of having to retype it again. Because why do you want to retype everything every time you're going to run something? But going back to this command I just ran, it was this one here. And uh, that actually might look familiar. It's like you know the same operators that we were using you know, direction on in C out, C in. It takes stuff in, puts stuff out on the standard input output, which is the same concept. It comes from C, by the way. So, so my program and then to a file name uses it to redirect the output to uh, my program, which is going to be the file name. So, and similar, we can append the output to files instead of rewriting it. So we can append with this. So that should look familiar for people who use C++, C in and C out. So directional says append it. So we're going to write it out. We're going to append it out so instead of rewriting it, overwriting it. So as I uh, promised, I was going to, I was actually going to have a lunch break at noon, and I have like 50 slides. I got like I'm not, I'm not as far through this lecture as I wanted to be. Uh, and I know some of you probably are getting hungry, and I promise I don't break my promises. So I'm, what I'm going to do is kind of end this lecture, and then we're not done with it there. Pick it up after our lunch break, and then uh, give you guys a break at least for some of you have to go to the bathroom or something. Uh, I don't like to talk for more than a couple hours anyway, so, <laughs> so I'm going to take a break. You guys are going to take a break. If you came in late, make sure this is the TA over here. She's a, uh, why don't you stand up real quick here? She's our TA. 
she has uh, sent out, so actually here, let me stop this video real quick and then I'll to give you the administrative stuff. So this is part one of lecture one. And just so you know, I'm recording this, although you can't see it, I'm actually recording it. So if you happen to miss something, you can uh, come back and look at it. But uh, don't leave yet, I've got some announcements to make.